It's Wednesday, October 2. Good afternoon. I'm Herman Green with your midday news. A special welcome if you're watching online at onespotmedia.com. We begin with tragic news as an 18-month-old baby perished in a fire Monday night in Big Lane Central Village, St. Catherine. 29 other persons, including children, are now homeless as a result of the fire. Now, amidst the grief, some residents are accusing the mother of negligence. TVJ's Shamela Pullen reports. It was minutes after 7 Monday evening when a fire broke out in Big Lane Central Village, St. Catherine. We were up on the road and we heard them about the fire, fire, fire. So when the runner go up there, like about five or six hours in the yard, or seven hours, and everything burned down. A large crowd converged as crime scene detectives processed the area. This followed news that an 18-month-old baby girl, Kira Davis, perished in the fire. According to reports, Kira was at home when the fire started. But tempers are running high in the community as residents are accusing the mother, Shelly and Wright, of causing Kira's death. They said Miss Wright ran out of the house when the fire started and left the child inside. But Ms. Wright told TVJ News that she left her daughter to get diapers and mosquito destroyer at a nearby shop when the fire started. Here when Claudia the fire, Shelly and Shelly and I'm answer. When me answer now, she said fire, when me look, me see the fire, blaze up so. When me run going in the house now, the fire come pan the long side to which one, me turn her head. When me push the door for going in the fire, bounce me out. Residents said persons tried to save the little girl but were overwhelmed by the smoke. The residents are also blaming Miss Wright for leaving a lit candle inside the house. Because them saw the fire start in the baby room. She put the candle inside of the baby room. The light one candle in the house and the one candle in the light is up at the front part where my son is. I'm a deep freeze tap. So I'm not like no candle down there. So I, and it's very touchy. So I light like the candle down there. I know so she'll get up and sit and touch it. So I don't like no candle down there. The other candle. The other can go, put them right down there, pan the dresser. Meanwhile, 29 other persons, including children, are now homeless. An appeal is being made to get them help. What I understand this morning is that um, there, there was a candle lit in the house last night, and unfortunately, it burned to, um, to the ground. Shamela Pullen, TVJ News. A parliamentary committee that reviewed the Child Care and Protection Act is recommending that new measures be put in place to protect children who are involved in sexual activities. The recommendations were presented to Parliament on Tuesday by Justice Minister Delroy Chuck. Among the recommendations, the committee says the age of consent should not be changed from 16 years. However, changes should be made to how the state deals with underage persons having sex with each other. Children, that is persons under 17, 16 and under, engage in sexual activity. Consensually, the feeling is that they should now be diverted to child diversion, counseling, med mentoring, so that they're not criminalized. We go further to, Mr. Speaker, that if there's a four age gap, four years, four years gap, so 13 and 17, 15 and 19, if it is consensual sex, and the parties have agreed we should not criminalize it. We should send the parties to counseling. That recommendation is among several others made after the committee reviewed that and other acts. The committee also brought aspects of the Bogre law into question. Mr. Chuck, however, stated that any change to that act would be considered after a referendum. Ensure your products are of international standards. That's the urging from owner of Zima and Company as she responded to operators in the ganja industry who complain they are being shunned by distributors. Now, TVJ's O'Shane Masters has the details. These are just some of the ganja products distributed by Zimmer and Company. They're all packaged, labeled, and ready for the market. At the recent staging of Canex, some farmers argued that sales have been slowed due to a lack of distribution companies in Jamaica. We put the issue to head of Zimmer and Company, Tishura Gibbs. I don't know that it's more distribution companies that are required because what we have in the market today as finished products, I don't know that 
significant competition would aid it. Of course we need more companies because competition is always good. But what we need are manufacturing facilities that are manufacturing, producing, labeling to the highest global standards that are approved by the Ministry of Health. The Ganja industry continues to flourish in countries worldwide. Jamaica has been making strides, but not at the pace some locals would like. Ms. Gibbs says now is a time for farmers to start positioning themselves in the market. What I'd love to see is for the farmers to get the assistance they need to make sure their branding and their bottling and their labeling are to the highest standards. And then I'd love to see manufacturing facilities come on board that are able to produce at global standards as well. Meanwhile, with complaints about big investors coming to take over the industry, Founder of Kennex, Douglas Gordon, says farmers must work together to find a solution to some of the challenges. If, if we sit in a vacuum and we have opinions, that's all well and good, but it doesn't serve us. We have to have context. We have to have an understanding that as a global industry, you know, how, how this manifests is like a traditional industry. And so if we're not going to sort of pull up our, our socks and get in line with how that works, then it's the industry that's going to leave us behind. It's not the lack of governance governance or other organizations to facilitate the bridge. Shane Masters, TVJ News. There is a possibility that water supply in the corporate area could return to normal by the end of the month. President of the National Water Commission, NWC, Mark Barnett, made that announcement yesterday while speaking on RGRs Beyond the Headlines. The details in this report. In recent weeks, Jamaica has been experiencing increased rainfall, and as such, the inflows at the National Water Commission NWC catchment areas have improved. As a result, many are hoping that the water supply restriction in the corporate area could be lifted soon. NWC President Mark Barnett says that can only happen if water levels in the Mona Reservoir and the Hermitage Dam continue to improve. The Mona Reservoir is now at 54% of capacity, while the Hermitage Dam is at 72%. Mr. Barnett says some communities are now receiving water for longer hours than scheduled. They are not only seeing longer period of supply, but they are also seeing improved pressures in their, in their, in their tops. The plan is to really lift all restrictions. Uh, we, we, we are estimating if things continue as they are now, we should be able to lift restrictions uh, before the end of the month. But again, it's all subject to how the stream hold up, even if there's no rainfall. He added that rising water levels at both catchment facilities are now being closely monitored. You know, one of the things that we are mindful of, Dan, is that at the end of October, and assuming we get very little rain in November, immediately as December starts, we are really back into a dry period. And we're mindful of that, and that dry period lasts for at least four months. And so whatever storage that we are working to um, build, we want to ensure that it is built so we can carry ourselves over into next year. Oshane Masters, TVJ News. Meanwhile, the country's road infrastructure was last week impacted by heavy rains, which will be costing the country millions to carry out repair work. Speaking during the House of Representatives yesterday, Prime Minister Andrew Holness noted that the corporate area does not have sufficient drainage to deal with the volume of rainfall that occurred last week, hence the flooded roadways. He says investigations revealed that over 215 roads were blocked or damaged due to the heavy rains. Much of our infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, is obsolete and cannot withstand current weather events. Damage to road infrastructure from flood events in this fiscal year resulted in some 215 roads blocked or badly damaged, resulting in a bill of some $640 million. Mr. Holness noted that $87 million of that figure was due to occurrences earlier this year. Into fiscal year for emergency repairs, and we have paid out 54.75. There is growing outrage to an amendment to the Access to Information Act tabled by the government in Parliament on Tuesday. Minister with Responsibility for Information, Carl Samuda, moved the resolution seeking to amend the act 
the ATI Act to extend the time for which the public is denied access to cabinet documents from 20 years to 70 years. Among several groups taking issue with this proposal is the Press Association of Jamaica, PAJ. Now, President George Davis expressed disbelief at the suggestion, stating that it attacks transparency and accountability in governance. This move from the government is a backward step in every respect. What is true is that every member of this current cabinet will be long dead and gone by the time we are able to access documents talking about the decisions that they made and the things that informed the decisions that they made if we are to abide by this 70-year time stamp. Now, human rights groups have also joined in with the outcry, and we'll have more details on their reactions in primetime news at 7. And it's time now for a preview of what's coming up in this evening's Health Report. In the next edition of the Health Report, we look at palliative care. So many people with advanced cancer would be suffering on many levels with pain, nausea, vomiting, difficult wounds, bleeding, shortness of breath, poor appetite, weight loss, and that's just the physical suffering, of course. You'll be suffering on an emotional level and probably a spiritual level as well, and it won't just be you, it will be your family members and your loved ones who are seeing you ill will also have some level of suffering. So palliative care is really a team approach that's the health report this evening in primetime news. And now for today's healthy living tip. Help loved ones change positions often, every two or three hours if bedridden, to prevent bed sores. Encourage your loved ones to get out of bed and sit up on a chair for meals if possible. Remove soiled clothing and bedding as soon as possible. And elevate the head of the bed or have your loved ones sit up in bed, especially when drinking liquids. We go down to news overseas. A State Department Inspector General will brief congressional committees today after requesting an urgent meeting in a new twist to the impeachment inquiry that has pitched U.S. President Donald Trump's presidency into its deepest ever crisis. We have the details from the CNN. While President Trump continues to attack the whistleblower behind his impeachment inquiry, both on Twitter and on camera. You have a whistleblower that reports things that were incorrect. His Secretary of State today is pushing back on House Democrats looking to question some of his employees. In a letter, Mike Pompeo saying Democrats are trying to intimidate, bully, and treat improperly the distinguished professionals of the Department of State. Did you feel pressure from President Trump to investigate the Bidens in order to unfreeze military? Uh, yep. I understood. I'd like to tell you that I never feel pressure. All this as the president's defenders follow his lead in trying to disparage the whistleblower's credibility. The thing is filled with, I don't know, I heard, I overheard. There's not a single time he says, I know. And there are some Trump allies who are worried that the White House was not adequately prepared for this fast-moving impeachment inquiry. And while CNN has learned that there are no plans as of right now for a war room to be established, we have also learned that the president's aides are expected to present him with a response plan as soon as this week. And we go on to sports. National shot put champion Daniel Thomas Dodd looks poised to improve on her fourth place in London two years ago as she secured qualification on Wednesday's sixth day of competition. TVJ's Keon Rayner reports from Doha. Daniel Thomas Dodd, the Commonwealth and Pan American Games champion, will enter Thursday's final with some amount of confidence. This after she heaved the implement to 19.32 meters on her third and final attempt. It's been a while since I last competed, so you know I was a bit jittery and I was rushing my technique. And then, you know, once I realized that um, I didn't get the auto on the first two throws, I was, um, you know, I was a bit worried. Yes, but you know, of course, I had to hold my composure and just focus on what I've been training, and, um, you know, what I've been doing. So that's what I did, and I was able to get the auto qualifier. 
the gamble by Commonwealth Games 3000 meter steeplechase champion Aisha Proud Lair to compete in the 1500 meters backfired as she only returned 4 minutes 09.81 seconds and missed out on the semi finals. It was really difficult out there. Um, we were very fart lucky, uh, surging and surging, and so many pace changes and uh, lead changes. So I just tried to stay calm and know that I. I've really been working on my closing speed and practice. I probably wasted a little bit of energy moving around out there, but this is my first sort of outdoor championship 15, so giving myself a little space to learn. Shani Slov could only manage 59.50 meters in group A of qualifying of the discus, and she must now wait to see if she gets a chance to qualify. Well, my first two throws, I was thinking too much, and then my last throw was like, you know what, this is my last throw. It, was, it is what it is, so I just went after it more and less thinking on that one. So, Still to come later are the 400 meter semi-finals where Akeem Bloomfield and Demish Gay will be in action. The 400 meter hurdle semi-finals will also take place where we'll have national champion Russell Clayton and world junior silver medalist Sheehan Salmon competing. Reporting from the 17th IAAF World Championships in Doha, I am Keon Reyna for TVJ Sports. And a quick update from Doha. Omar McLeod just won his 110-meter hurdle semifinal a short while ago with a time of 13.08 to cement his place in the finals set for 3 o'clock Jamaica time. And that's the midday news on behalf of the entire team. Pleasant viewing. Thank you.